to the fearless curious soul Goldilocks Productions presents the deep reading <laughs> connecting you to your soul show this is Suzanne Wyman the deep psychic <clears throat> hello and welcome and thank you for joining me today please think about the commentary that you're listening to uh, that you can relate to it if it sounds like something that would interest you or as if the universe is answering your prayers I want you to feel included and know that if this conversation resonates to who and what you are, then you are a part of something that is greater than yourself. The universe is connecting to you, answering your questions. Today I've got a great show lined up. I've got some great personal questions from people, and I've also got a person who calls herself an animal communicator. And, and let's start with my first question, talking about relationships. So today's conversation is uh, connecting to that part of yourself that you are unaware that you are truly still connected to. So it is about the connection, the unconscious connection, the conscious connection, the spiritual connection, and how you are living out that part of your life. I'm doing a party today <clears throat> for a group of lawyers that are supporting um, people that need consultations on how to put together uh, power of attorney and how to um, settle up some of their final matters, write a will, and understand the rights that are involved in that. It's an elder workshop for people that uh, want low-cost consultations. So I'm really looking forward to that event tonight, and uh, it also provides services with people that need to understand their rights better because they have a disability. So I don't know, is that the correct PC term that we use today for talking about a person who has a disability, or is there another term? I'm not up to date on that one. So I'm ready for my first caller, and... Today I don't have my um, astrology consultation going on, so I will be talking about one of the things I do is I do transits, and uh, transits are extremely helpful when you're in the middle of a uh, when you're in the middle of a, a change. You want to know what's happening at the deeper level, and so I put those in a PDF. And I, hey Laura, are you where? Yeah. Are you there? Hey, Laura. Hi, I am. Hi. Oh, good. you got to speak up just a tiny bit for me, please. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. Did you want to ask a question? I do. I am wondering, what can I do to change the dynamic of my relationship? Okay. And what's the problem in the relationship? Well... We're just not getting along very well, and I feel like we're drifting apart. Okay. So just just like in a general sense, can you tell me mm-hmm. if this is a type of relationship that you've been involved with in the past? I mean, is it, like some people, I always used to make a joke that I had repeatedly married my mother, and uh-huh. um, so, so um, that was that was a joke, but... I usually marry somebody like our mother or like our father, but in this case, I'm just going to keep the question more open. Are you, are, do you find yourself attracted to the same type of person? Yes, pretty much I do. Okay, and what type of person is that? Unfortunately, someone who is not very strong. I feel like I am stronger than that person. Uh-huh. Uh, just emotionally a lot stronger. I know what I want out of life, and this person is a little bit more confused, I think, without them actually realizing that. (laughs) Okay. And so is this a person who has a problem with... um, Honesty. They're they're afraid Mm -hmm. of themselves, and they run from themselves, and they act this part out in an addictive way. Maybe they're compulsive or obsessive, but there's some aspect of the situation where the person is addictive. Yes. Okay. All right. Really good. 
Thank you for being honest about this. I'm sure it's not easy. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And how long have the two of you been together? About 10 years. That's a long time. It is. Okay. So I'm going to do I'm going to go about this a little differently. What would you say were the good things in the 10 years that you, the two of you have been together? What are the good things? The good things were up until the last couple of years, I felt that we had an honest relationship, which later I found out wasn't so honest, but mm-hmm. we had a lot of fun together. We did a lot of things. You know, we went hiking. We went out with friends. Mm-hmm. We just drove up the coast. We had a lot of fun. Okay. And I'm, I'm thinking that today none of that is there. No. Okay. So the first impression that I got, the first thing I sort of tuned in on, is that this person had a, um, some sort of a confrontation, a break with reality, um, a loss in that period of time. In the past three years somewhere, something happened where they lost somebody Maybe something that you didn't think of as important, but to this person it was important. Is that possible? You can see that. It's possible. Okay. Okay. That'd be possible. What would you? What would you? I mean, this is always my favorite part of the question. This is my favorite Mm -hmm. part. Would you? Do you want to work this out and heal this, or do you want to? Do you want to end this, or do you want? Do you want? And this is a better question. If you think about this. Do you want to be in control of the outcome so you can know if you're going to be safe in the future? I want to know what I want. <laughs> I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not sure what to do. Uh-huh. I just want to be happy. Right. So <clears throat> it's kind of a, I love that you've done this and that you've asked this question this way because how can I be of assistance to you until you know who you are, what you are, and what your part in the situation is. Currently, you're allowing it to happen. And so that is the question. What is it that you do want? Do you want to heal this relationship? Do you want to move away from this relationship? Or do you simply want to control the outcome? Because I think this situation has kind of gotten you rattled and you feel like you're kind of coming undone at the moment. Correct. Okay. So... You know, nobody knows who you are. You're talking here out in the air. Mm -hmm. I'm showing people how I talk to them about relationships and get results because that is my favorite thing. I get results. Mm -hmm. Um, do Do you want to stay and try and heal this situation? And that's why you can't really let go. I think I I want to stay if I saw a future for us, I'm just not so sure that it could work because we are very different people than what I had originally thought. (laughs) Okay, great. Has anybody ever told you that you're controlling? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I I love the pause. I'm so sorry. That was so classic. Yes. Well, Well, yes, yes. Now that you mentioned that, yes. Okay, so I gave you three options. I said stay and heal the relationship, (laughs) let go, or stay and control the outcome so you know you're safe. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem in relationships. Um, So I spent, and I'm going to digress for a moment, but I promise I'm going to come back to you, so hang in there with me, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I spent a period of time with somebody who is very, very controlling. I spent a period of time, um, I, think it was, I think it was eight days, and um, I found this person to be so controlling that I thought, oh, my God, I, I am ready to just walk away. Um, mm-hmm. And um, it, it turned out that I was in Rwanda, and I couldn't just take, I was uh, mm-hmm. in the countryside of Rwanda on the border um, to the Congo, and I couldn't just take and walk away. I really could have, but I felt as if I should give this person one more opportunity to sort something out with me. And I came to this 
great epiphany. It was really amazing because um, you really would think that there wouldn't be any place for any information to come in in that situation. But this is what came in. I realized that um, when I become controlling, and when I take and I, I think, oh, my God, I need to control this because it's not going the way it should be going and I need to control it, I realized that it was a negative expression for power. And really what I wanted was a deeper sense of empowerment and putting myself in control was momentary, but the other people in the situation didn't like it because they wanted their own sense of control. And so... It was defeating, and I had to immediately take and create control again. So once I realized what was going on, then I was able to sit back and detach myself and observe. Now, I'm not saying this didn't cost me something as far as inconvenience, Mm -hmm. difficulty, or hardship, but it gave me an opportunity to actually observe the situation. And this is what I'm going to tell you. As long as you are trying to control the outcome of this situation, you're never really going to be able to observe what is going on. And that is what the problem is. Personally, I've been in relationships for, um, where I was in a relationship for more than 10 years, not exactly happy, but more than 10 years. And I know what what you're talking about. I, I know what you're talking about. But in this situation, I think there is a lot of happiness potentially between the two of you. But I've got to find a way for you to step back and breathe and observe and then, then take and look at how you react instead of, I'm going to be in control. I'm going to make sure this turns out the way it's supposed to turn out. And that's, mm-hmm. where, that's where you're inflicting pain on yourself. And <clears throat> this is a very personal observation about you, and I'm sure it's not exactly comfortable, but I also think if you and I are honest in this conversation, that there's something about what I've said to you that is real. Is that, mm-hmm. is that true? Okay. Sure. So, mm-hmm. and, and so... Um, I believe that your relationship with this person can be changed. I think that you can heal this dynamic. Um, You're going to have to let go of control. You're going to have to become more detached. You're going to have to focus on yourself and what you need, what you like, and what you should do to take care of yourself and your other responsibilities. Are there children involved in this relationship? I have children of my own, not together. Okay. Okay. I always tell people, once we have children, the children come first. Whatever we need or want or like or anything else, that just doesn't Mm -hmm. even enter into the question. It's all about the children. Okay. So, um, and that is kind of an added piece. Do your children children attach, bond, and enjoy this person themselves? I feel that their feelings are changing as of the last couple of years as well because they're seeing – this person's true color is coming out a little bit. And they also want me to be happy, and they see that I haven't been. So they can't help but take that, you know, personal. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're impacted. If their mother's unhappy and they watch their mother being mistreated, they're not going to be okay with that. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. That's like sort of the sum total of it. Right. Were either one of your parents like this? Um, a little bit. Okay. Describe that, please. Um, just as far as being very strong, very loud, and controlling, okay. extremely controlling um, to the point of abuse. Okay. And mother, father, who? Father. Okay. So did he, was he a strict parent and said that it was, it was the correct thing for a father to do using religion or society or other things outside of himself to justify his bad acts? A little bit, yes. Okay. So yeah, just his right he, as a parent. 
She's trying it as a parent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm always amazed at people that they know they're wrong, and so instead of saying, well, I need to work on myself or I have a problem and I shouldn't be doing this, they say, well, you know, that's just, that's just the way parents do it. And so mm-hmm. they, they don't take responsibility for it. Your situation here, I'm going to wrap this up really tidy here for a second. Mm-hmm. I want you to take and keep a dream journal. I want you to take and keep a dream journal for 40 days and 40 nights. Whatever, you don't have to immediately be able to write out your dreams fully. What you want to do is you want to write out, I woke up feeling angry, I I felt confused, I felt upset, I felt disturbed, whatever it is. And then write the dreams, slowly the dreams. You tell yourself before you go to sleep, I remember my dreams with great clarity. Your dreams will tell you an extremely specific story as to what is going on. My, My feeling in this situation is is that you need to find a good therapist. And if he won't go with you to the therapy, then you need to go to the therapy and find out why uh, you pick the same person. Mm-hmm. When you see yourself getting into the issue of being controlling, you need to be objective and you need to step back. We are in the middle of Mercury retrograde, so I don't suggest that people end a relationship at this moment because they just come right back to it. That's the way mm-hmm. that one goes. So... But this is going to take some work. I mean, you're not going to take and find that you're, you know, you're going to have easy answers. You yourself have not decided if you want to stay and heal this dynamic, you want to leave, or um, what your part is in this. And I think that I think there's some happiness here, and I would like to see you try these things before you end a 10-year relationship um, and focus your mind on the happier times and focus your mind on the good feelings and focus on what it felt like when you were in love with this person. And that's, <clears throat> that's where your focus needs to be today. And the mm-hmm. other thing is that you need to put a good support system around you of girlfriends that you call them up and saying, listen, right. I really need to get out of here for a few hours. And you need to leave. If you feel disrespected, you need to leave. If you feel as if you're not safe, you need to leave. If you feel emotionally unsafe, you need to leave. But you need to take and do the things to take care of yourself and show your children how people work out their relationship issues. And, um, and of course, you know, you are welcome to talk to me further. There's a great book. It's called um, Centering on the Art of Intimacy. Um, it's by Hendrix. And I think, I think what's happened is that you have an old archetype or an old part of your personality that you have not let go of. It has died and it is gone, and you need to figure out how to let go of that. That's another mm-hmm. part of the equation of what's going on. I don't think you're the same person that you were when you got involved with this person. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much for calling right. and being open. All right. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, bye. <clears throat> bye. Great conversation. Great conversation. I think relation. I really believe in relationships. I support relationships. I encourage relationship. I I think that often my favorite comment is a uh, Italian proverb that says, you know, nobody really knows what's at the bottom of a marriage. It's like a pot of soup. Only the two spoons in it know what's at the bottom of the pot. For those of you who've been married for a long time. You get that one, but um, relationships take a lot of effort and energy. Great, great relationships empower us, strengthen us, make our burdens uh, easier, teach us about ourselves, and make it possible for our life to be emotionally, physically, mentally more prosperous. Negative relationships seem to sort of take up a lot of time, effort, and energy and just go nowhere except for into a, an endless black hole. So... Um, but I like to listen to what people say is the happy moments in their life and what makes them feel good. <clears throat> and then that's, that becomes my primary focus of the conversation because um, generally spe- speaking, not always, but generally speaking, people don't choose to be in relationships um, unless they make them happy. So I'm ready for my next caller, and I'm hoping that I've got a second caller in here. It's kind of a um, it's kind of an interesting day to um, bring in callers. It's Mercury Retrograde, Series of Misunderstandings, 
and um, just trying to get people to, you know, understand the time frame uh, that they're supposed to call in. So I'm here. Hey, I was just going to talk to you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Tell tell everybody your name. This is Jenny. Jenny. Wow. Okay. How's your patience level today? Oh, um, that's a good question. I think it's okay. Okay, good. Okay, so let's do your question. Okay, so um, I'm wondering, um, you know, I think I have these spiritual gifts, or so I've been told, and I've been working on developing some of them. Okay. Um, but I would love to be able to use them to um, support myself someday, hopefully soon, sooner than later. Um, so I'm just wondering how can I sort of, you know, fine-tune that process so that I can get started. What would you say was the greatest problem with, I mean, it's a broad stroke remark. It applies to everybody today who's listening. But what would you say was the greatest problem for a person being able to manifest their spiritual gifts in a tangible way in the physical world? What would you say was the greatest obstacle? I think the devotion, the devotion yeah. to it, um, yeah, and then also just yeah, just having the discipline. No. None of those things are necessary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> None of them, okay? Do you know what's completely necessary is to have no doubt, no doubt whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. So if you, if you say, oh, I sort of believe this or I sort of think that, there's an element of doubt. And guess what? Spirit says, oh, well, she's not really ready. Um, and you say, well, I, 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 I don't know. But, but I think that Spirit has guided me to say the following. Guess what? Spirit's not going to really guide you. So what you say is, is that you say to yourself is, is that I believe in my gifts. I believe in my talents. I believe in my capabilities. I believe in my strengths. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. And obviously, we're not going to say no doubt because that would be um, affirming doubt. So you're going to say, I trust. There's, there's trust. Mm -hmm. Okay? So okay. Mm -hmm. what is it that is your greatest gift today? Not tomorrow or possible or anything else. What's your greatest gift? Mm. Wow. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh <-oh>. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. What? I can't think of I can't think of anything you know today. Um, try. Really give it a try. Okay. We're talking. This okay. is for you, not for me. Okay. Yeah. What would you say your greatest gift is spiritually? Okay, spiritually. Um I think just being empathetic. I think just being empathetic. Can we make that an empowered statement? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think my, my empathy towards others, you know, helps me, you know, be the person that I am and then just, you know, so that I can be there for other people. So sorry to take you to task like this. I'm really sorry. Is empathy a thinking process or a feeling process? Oh, um, to me, it's just feeling like it's, okay. it's almost like I didn't even realize that I was an empath until somebody told me and that it's, everything just kind of has clicked since then. Okay. I feel empathetic. I feel empathetic in my work. I feel as if my work as an empath is my point of power. Do you, do you feel the difference mm -hmm. in that commentary? Um, between what I said and what you said? Yeah, affirming that you feel you're an empath rather than saying, I think that I could be a empath. You feel the shift. Mm -hmm. subtle. I feel I'm an empath. I feel as if my greatest work occurs when I'm tapped into my empathetic nature. Mm -hmm. This is power. This is connection. This is ownership. This is, this is where you eliminate the, uh, the aspect of doubt and you bring it into reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you a personal question. Is that okay? Sure. 
were you raised in an environment, your um, family of origins, where a lot of people spent a lot of time negating you, dismissing you, minimizing you, and just sort of like, well, you know, may- maybe you could do that, but I-, I really don't think so. Or, yeah, you did that once, but I don't think you can do it a second time. Were you raised in that kind of an environment that didn't acknowledge you as a person who had talent, God-given gifts, um, but you were sort of minimized, marginalized, and they had great explanations for it, but were you raised Hmm. in that sort of an environment? I guess I don't really remember, um, like, feeling like that, but, I mean, I'm sure I was, I'm sure there was some elements of that, because I grew up with three other um, sisters, and my oldest sister was, like, the star basketball player, so everything <laughs> was, like, you know, everything devoted went to, to her. her. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, that, and then the yeah. next sister was what? Me. Okay. And so, so then there was a younger sister? Yeah, so I'm the second oldest. So then we were three in a row, and then uh-huh. the youngest is four years younger than I am. Okay. So um, I, I, love, I love the fact that you said that. I mean, I just love that because you do know you're a middle daughter, okay? And, yeah. And what, are, <laughs> yeah. And, and what are the things of the middle child, okay? What, what are, the, what are the, the totally, like, known things if we look at birth order and the middle child? The middle child, you know, endures hardship. They're the very last, tri- they're the very last person to admit that they need help and therapy. They're the last person to give up on a relationship. I mean, the middle child is basically the child who, um, the firstborn child gets everything, right? And then, mm-hmm. um, and then there's the next child. But you have, um, basically what you've told me is, is that there's three of you born really close in birth order, and then there's mm-hmm. a little gap. Four years is not mm-hmm. really a big gap. There's another one. So <clears throat> I guess they were looking for a boy. Yes. <laughs> okay. So you know what I yes. tell parents when they, when they show up with, you know, they get, they get like, you know, five girls. You know, there's no boy. I say, don't you worry. Um, those girls will bring home the boys soon enough, and then you'll get your boys. And people right. look at me like, yeah, right. That's not what I was thinking about. But. That is how it works, okay? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think the first piece of business that you, you really want to get on your spiritual journey, you want to get to work on your spiritual gifts, um, your first piece of the journey is to really empower yourself. Don't miss any opportunities to empower yourself. I like, I like Louise Hay and how she talks about mm-hmm. empowerment. But there's a part yeah. of you, there's a, there's a gap. There's, there's your talent, your capabilities, your strengths, and your assets, and your gifts, which are God-given, and then there is the actual demonstration. And so I just want to take and help you over that, that gap, and then you'll see that there really is no, there is no hesitation. You really are talented. And I've been, I've been around athletes and you know, athletes are treated like demigods. They're treated like they are the stars. And so if your mm-hmm. oldest sister was, was the demigod, <clears throat> you know, her games, her training, her equipment, everything about that came first. And then there was mm-hmm. you, and then there was another child. And, you mm-hmm. know, it is a sad comment on parenting done, you know, <laughs> in that method, but it happens. That's It happens. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that, I think you kind of have an opportunity to take and balance that for yourself. Here's what I see about you. You're empathetic. You're strong. You're sensitive. You're very self-aware. You're very much the person who's able to use your third chakra to go into a room and scan a setting effectively. But Mm. you have kind of used that scanning process and have picked up on people that only validate you. And really what you need to do is have enough self-confidence to believe that if you walk into a situation and you scan a, you scan a room full of people and you scan the individual and you say, that person's not right for me, I'm not going to go near that situation, I'm going to stay away, 
you're going to become stronger and you're going to trust that process and you're going to use it more effectively. Part of you says, well, I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong. And this is where you end up getting with people that do not completely support you, believe in you, and uphold and empower you. And that's the difference. It's a subtle thing. It's a very subtle thing. But I think that if you follow that process and actually trust that, Hilleron, Hilleron wrote extensively. There's three power points in that, um, in the solar plexus chakra. It's the last chakra, which refers to our animal nature. It's the first time that once we cross out of that chakra that we walk into um, the ability to become spiritual human beings. It is um, your liver operates as a giant um, receptor for picking up sensitivity and subtle information. It's like your liver connects you to the universe. And your stomach um, connects you to um, digestion. And the center of your solar plexus push, puts you in the position of assimilating those processes. Have an imbalance in your liver or your stomach, and the process of assimilation doesn't go forward. It's also the point where um, masculine and feminine, feminine energy cross over, and that's Dr. Stone's work in polarity therapy. So there's so mm. many things, but that is your strongest working chakra. That is your chakra where you are really able to take and read people, read situations, and do that very natural scanning energy. But then you think about it, and it, it leads you off the track. So that's my, that's my observation of you as a psychic. I love working with psychics and talking to psychics. It's my favorite uh, piece mm -hmm. of work. So... Um, and do you have, uh, is that helpful? I guess that's what I want to do is I want you to wrap up this comment with me and tell me if that's helpful for you. It is, yeah. Um, it's interesting that you say the word psychic because I know all of us are psychic and in a way, and, you know, some of it's more natural and you have to work on it. But do you, do you feel like I have that, that ability to actually really tap I into? Think, I think you've been working from that psychic energy. It's just that nobody has shown mm -hmm. you how to use it. So you have, you mm -hmm. have taken and, and because you don't have a, forgive me for saying this so bluntly, you lack confidence mm -hmm. in your capabilities. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you had more confidence, you wouldn't be asking me for affirmation. You'd say, yeah, I have, um, I'm psychic about lost objects. I'm psychic about people coming to the door. You would know where your psychic ability, my original um, early psychic ability was being able to tell who was on the telephone. I found out it freaked people mm. out when I picked up and said, hey, hey, Carol, how's it going? Or, hey, Grandma, there you are. You know, I found mm -hmm. it freaked them out. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, I stopped it. Um, but mm. if you're psychic, you know where you're psychic, you have enough confidence in it, you start doing it. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. You're welcome to call me anytime. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Okay, take right. care. You too. Working with psychics, I think it's one of my favorite things in the whole world. Um, able to spot where people's talents, capabilities are, uh, what they bring in in genetic memories, and also what they um, bring in as their own soul process. So you are... Uh, you're here connected to Suzanne Wyman, the deep psychic, and I am doing the deep readings connecting you to your soul. And the call-in number is 206-806-9965. My personal phone number is 714-400-7384. And I'm hoping, just hoping, 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 I've got another caller here. And... Um, I'd like to introduce somebody. Let's see if I've got let's see if I've got another person here waiting for me. And um ah, Kara is here. So um I am oh, Kara, is that you? Yes, it's me. <laughs> How are you today? I am fabulous. How are you? Oh, I am great. Thank you so much for coming on to my show and sharing with all of us about what it means to be an animal communicator and tell people how they can get a hold of you. 
Oh, okay. Thank you so much for having me, Suzanne. I love your show. Um, uh, an animal <laughs> communicator. You're so good. You're so good. Get that right up um, front. I'm going to reach over there and kiss you. Mwah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I, I am an animal communicator, and uh, uh, my, my website is pet iview.com just like birds iview with the i e y e spelled out and you can also find me on facebook at pets iview and also instagram um pets iview and uh i have been talking to animals for several years now professionally and my whole life without acknowledging it as a true gift and skill because I was raised in a very typical family that would not recognize a psychic gift if it hit them over the head, if you will. Um, So how an animal communicator is maybe different than um, a psychic, in Mm -hmm. my opinion, and we can have a discussion about that, is that a very well-trained animal communicator um, a psychic can still tell you, of course, how an animal feels or thinks about a situation. And a good animal communicator should have an awful lot of deep animal knowledge about mm. behavior and training and feeding and uh, um, nutrition, as well as metaphysical tools and their tool bags to help solve situations or give you tips that will allow you to have a more harmonious home. Um, So at my website, for example, one of the things I'm really big on is every animal needs to have a purposeful job in your home. So if you go to my website, you can download an e-book that's called Give Your Pet a Purpose. If you don't give your pet a purpose, like literally half an hour ago, Suzanne, I was talking to two dogs and a cat in a household, and one of the dogs said, I am in charge, and I showed me herself wearing a, a policeman uniform. <laughs> and that was, that was not the job that her owners wanted her to have. And, in fact, they said, when the, the husband said, I am a security guard, and we actually joke that she wants to, like, wear my pants and, like, go to work with me. So um, so I think it's really important that we set the tone for our animals. And so what I do is not only combine some telepathy and communication with talking to the owner, but also with true understanding of how animals work so that their lives can improve. Cool. Really? Cool. So here's what I heard that animals are, um, they're like humans. They need a purpose. They need something to fulfill. They need to be a worker, and they need to be um, connected to the family through that job. If you don't give them a job, they'll find a job for themselves, and you may not like their pick. So Absolutely correct. Okay. The next thing I heard is, is that there's people that are psychics and everything else, but if they don't have the knowledge, the practical knowledge of what is the makings of different types of animals or different breeds, then they don't really have enough knowledge in order to guide a person through the problem, which I think is a very interesting point for you to make because I believe in practical functional knowledge, and that is an important practical piece of the business. And Then the other thing I thought that was really fascinating, what you said, was, because I've read an author by the name of Karen Pryor, talk about telepathy with the animals. So animals communicate through telepathy, and people don't, they don't really understand that. So the animal doesn't communicate with you using words and vocabulary like the humans do, but they use um, this telepathic, for me, when I communicate with animals, it's imagery. So um, I don't yeah. think I'm really, I do not think I am a good pet psychic. Let me, let me add that right out there. Um, <laughs> because, um, well, I have, I have a couple of problems. But anyway, um, basically, 
I ended up in a situation, and maybe you'll find this an interesting story. Um, my husband and I were living in San Juan Capistrano, and we were living in this really beautiful house, and the house overlooked a golf course. But it was a very um, quiet community, and a lot of the homes in the area were other people's second or third home, and they weren't there much. And so the neighborhood was absolutely still quiet, which was lovely. It was the quietest place I've ever lived. But there was no humans and so there were no human sounds. There was no human interaction. It was extremely isolating for me. And I thought, well, what's going to happen when I move out into the country? What happened is, is I became friends with the local animals. And that was not a good thing for me. And I formed a relationship where I began to believe that the crows in the area were my family. And the crows would show up, and I would give them food, and I would ask them how their family was doing. Or I'd tell them, I'd say, hey, there's a hawk in the neighborhood. You have left that, that squawking kid alone way too long. You've attracted too much attention. You need to, you know, do something about it. But I told the crows that they were to tell me when somebody was arriving. And I gave them two parts to the assignment. One was is when the person I was expecting got off the freeway. And the second part was is when they parked their car. They were to give me two, you know, notices. And my crows worked for me. But it was not good long term because they were not people. I treated them like people, and I knew I was part of their family when they brought their dead to me to be buried. They bury their dead. And um, I don't know. It's a very strange connection with the animals. So I moved out of that situation. I'm now in Dana Point. I love it in Dana Point. There's people around. There's noises and stuff like that. I don't need a lot of interaction because I talk to people, but there's human noises going on around me. And there's people moving and doing stuff, cars and trash cans and, you know, people walking their dogs. So tell us, tell us your favorite animal story, please. Um, I think my most recent favorite is, uh, <laughs> my most recent favorite is a wonderful dog named Pino, a French bulldog, a little small stocky, black, a pure black little dog who just passed away at the ripe old age of 15 and a half. Um, and I'm actually going to be, I just wrote a story about him for Radiance Magazine, uh, which should be in this issue. It is in this issue, I believe. But let me tell you about Pino. Pino met me about six months ago, and he was starting not to be able to walk with his hind legs. And his owners wanted to know if it was time to put Pino to sleep. I will never, as an animal communicator, be uh, the grim reaper. That's not my job. But I will tell people how an animal is feeling in his or her body. And 95% of the time, the animals will give an emphatic no way. Right? Okay. So uh, Pino told me, in no uncertain terms, that he was made of sunshine, farts, and giggles, <laughs> and that he missed the green and yellow comforter that he had had for many years, and they needed to find it and put it out for him, and that he would be perfectly happy if they would get him a stroller, please, and take him for walks on the beach. So they thought I was crazy because they didn't have a green and yellow comforter or blue and yellow comforter, whatever it was. And I said, I, I don't know. That's what I'm hearing. Um, and two days later, they found the comforter in the garage. Uh, and he lived another couple of months, three, four months. And then they called me again because he was struggling. And he said again that he was not ready to go um, and that he was quite pleased with the artwork that they were going to be putting up on his, in his honor, and he told them exactly where to put it in the home. And wow. they were like, what artwork? I'm like, I don't know, I guess you're going to blow a picture up of him or something. Okay, fine. He died a week or two later, and two days after he died, her best friend presented her with an original watercolor that she had done of Pino. Oh, I love it. And 
so that's my favorite recent story. But I have lots of stories, and I think people call me for a variety of things, you know, everything from is my dog feeling okay to I miss my deceased pet, can I talk to them when two or three pets are not getting along in a home. Uh, I just did a lost dog in Vietnam uh, two days ago, and I told, no, maybe a week ago now, and I told them that he was about half a mile away and he was in between alleyways and I could see a noodle shop and another shop downstairs, but people live upstairs and two women had seen him and that I felt that they would be able to get him back. And he was indeed found by two women two or three days later near that noodle shop. So it's everything. Any issues with pets, I usually get a call. And I have some tips for your listeners if if we have time for that, too. Hey. Okay, so i got to do a short animal story. Um, okay. I saw, a, I saw a posting on my Next Door Neighbor app, and it was a friend of mine had lost their cat. And so I called them up. I said, look, there's a posting. It says you lost your cat. Did you find the cat? They said, no, the cat, the cat's gone. You know, I don't think I'll ever see the cat again. And this was an yeah. older person. <clears throat> I was like, I was like, look, let me come over and see if I can find the cat. And this is what the person said to me, and this is where volunteering gets in the way. I said, no, don't waste your time. Nobody can find that cat. He's gone. I luckily ignored that advice, and as soon yeah. as um, the car turned the corner, my headlights saw the cat sitting at the house next door to his home. <laughs> oh, how lucky is that? Now, That's here's wonderful. The uh, here's the mistake I made. I was sure the cat was in the park because the cat showed me the image of the park. In my stupidity, I didn't realize that the cat was across the street from the park in front of his house looking at the park. Okay. Okay. Little, well, I mean, there's nothing stupid about that. You could have very well been, you know, he could have been at the park five minutes before. But that's where it's always great to ask them, are you showing me this through your eyes or is this or, where you are at the moment? That's right. So we can't find the cat. The cat, as soon as the headlights hit it, dashes off. So... My friend leaves the front door open, goes out and looks around and everything else, and, uh, you know, just leaves the door open, goes out and takes a little walk and comes back. Comes back in the house, the cat's sitting at the door going, hey, where you been? I've been waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So for pe- people who have lost pets, of course, next door is really important and paw boost yeah. and your shelters. But also really important is to put out stinky clothing, um, uh, the litter box for the cat, and right. also to show them a picture, show them a mental picture of the door you want them to come back to. Okay. That's true. So they did that. They put out the clothing. They put out the litter box. The cat smelt the litter box, used it, and then took another little walk. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, but I never have had, I've had people call me up and ask me, and I'm like, I have no talent. So I thought, boy, this is really horrible. I call up this person and say, look, I'm willing to do this. And the person's like, don't bother. So, of course, they were extremely appreciative, and everything worked out nice. Um, and this is an older person who is reliant on this animal for love. So, of um, course. <laughs> um, keep talking. Tell us more about what you do. It's truly cool material. I love it. Um, well, in addition to talking to the animals, and for me, yes, I think uh, animals do talk primarily in images, but they will also use words and feelings as sensations. Um, I do a body scan with every reading. I'm not a veterinarian, and I always tell people they need to check with a veterinarian if there's any indication um, of a problem. Um, And then I do a lot of energy work as well. So when we have discovered 
that someone has the wrong job or like uh, I'm working with a client right now with a very anxious dog. Uh, we do have, are you familiar with emotional freedom technique, tapping? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, yeah. so I do emotional freedom technique, which is a combination of the Chinese uh, acupressure points for fear, grief, anger, and stress on the face, neck, and head of the human who has their own experience of whatever that bad animal behavior might be, right? And then we also tap on the dog or the cat or the horse itself for their experience of that emotion. And I do a lot of my work, 90% of it, remotely. So I use FaceTime or Zoom or just a phone call, and I train people how to touch their own animals um, while I am also acting as a surrogate for the animal. Um, and doing this really helps to break those black cords, if you will, of mm-hmm. expectation by the owner of the repeated poor behavior and right. expectation of the animal to, for example, with the anxious animal, live in fear. Another example would be sometimes a horse owner who competes in horse competitions will call me and Uh, the owner may not be that confident about how they're going to do in the ring. Meanwhile, we've got a very confident, one might say even arrogant horse saying, yeah, the only reason we're not going to do well in the ring is because you lack confidence. (laughs) So, you know, we tap. (laughs) What? I love that because, you know, that is the, the, people don't understand that relationship. When those two go into that go into that competition, it's the two of them together. The animal doesn't lose, and the hu- human win. Uh, it is the animal who wins, and the human brings in their confidence or takes away from that. And it's not it's not a one way street; it's a two way street. If you both go in yeah. to win, right? And people yeah. miss that that disconnect. So. Um, yeah. Promote, promote yourself one more time, and I'm so sorry. I would talk to you forever. Would you come back <laughs> on and talk again with us? I would love to. We can talk about any number of animal issues if you'd like. Um, I'd love it. Yes, my name is Kara, and I'm with Pets Eye View, and you can reach me at 949-282-3506, uh, 949-282-3506, or at Pets Eye View on the web. Oh, thank you so much. Have a great day. You've been fabulous. You've got a kiss and a hug for me. Kiss, hug. Mm, Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye-bye. Great conversation. I could sit and talk all day about animals and and the dynamic between the human and the animal and what that really means. But in some way or another, I have to stay on some sort of a schedule. I've got another person who's coming on who's got a really great question for us today. And I'm looking for Katie. This is Katie. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm doing excellent. How are you? Fabulous. Do your question for me. It's a great question. Um, I don't. I don't know what the cause of my bad relationships in my adult life are. Like, I don't know where they're coming from, but I have had several, and they just seem to reoccur at. And they seem to all be bad, even though I don't do anything. I'm like, I'm just, I don't know. They don't turn out well. Yeah. Okay. Narcissists. You attract narcissists. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Are you yes. a narcissist now? I believe I don't know what I'm with. I have no idea what I'm with. Uh-huh. Okay. I don't know. Okay. So are we doing the reading on, on you? Are you um, so what what is your question then? Are you are you in a are you in a negative relationship today or have you ended a relationship? Yeah, I'm in a negative relationship. Like it's not a good one and it has no like truth in it. Like there's no like there's no like truth in it, so it causes all these issues, um, constant issues, like and I just I, I don't know how to resolve that because I'm doing what I can and it's not resolving and I don't know how to stop myself from taking part in a bad relationship when there's nothing I can do to fix it I just feel like inclined to take part you know and I 
I loved him, but I don't understand it at all, that kind of thing. So can I get you to sort of, you know, put down any of your little distractions and fully focus there? It makes it easier. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Sorry, um, I'm, I'm on speaker, so I'm moving around a bit. <laughs> it's hard. You're a moving target. Yeah. I'm trying to... I'm trying to attach energy to try and feel the situation, and you keep moving. Okay, I'm sitting okay. still now. I'm definitely sitting okay. still. Yes, and I'm quiet. <laughs> are, you, are you somebody who, um, do you function at a higher level if you get enough exercise every day? Yes, yes, I do. Do you exercise every day, twice a day sometimes? Mm, I used to. I should. My work is very hands-on, so I'm always moving. Like, I don't stop moving throughout the day. Okay, so here's the difference between work that allows us to move. It becomes repetitive and boring to the body, whereas exercise is our choice, uh, and it reconnects us. So even if your work is physically demanding, you still have to set aside a period of time where you do something physically that you enjoy. And you're somebody I, who you need to exercise every single day of your life, or you are just, you're just on. You're just on. Yeah, exercise yeah that's helps you true. shut off. So mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you to think about your relationships differently. Form your, write out a list of the relationship you want. I want somebody who's committed, made it monogamous, um, attractive to me. I'm attractive to them. I'm sexually connected to them. I want you to write out a specific list of things that you want in a relationship. Don't think okay. about it. Don't edit yourself. Just write out the list. You write out the okay. list, and you read that list every morning when you first wake up, and you read it every night before you go to sleep. Okay. Yeah, I totally believe and in that. With, okay. And with confidence, you say, I attract this person into my life. That's the first uh-huh. step. The second step is, is that well, let's step away from the judgment of the relationship unless somebody is, you know, you know, sometimes people do behaviors because that's what you've always had in a relationship. They're unconscious and they act out these negative habits for you because that's what you expect in the relationship. And so let's set yeah. aside all of your previous knowledge, okay? Uh-huh. And the, third, the third thing is, is that I want you to stop thinking that a relationship is going to be fulfilling. I want you to think that you're <laughs> able to your own <laughs> Right. Yeah, I get that part. I understand that. Yeah. I don't think that. It isn't fulfilling. <laughs> They're not going to be fulfilling. You're going to fulfill yourself. You're going to have Yeah, to I don't see that that has ever been the case, and I don't think I expect one to be. I just want them to be, like, not traumatic or violent or upsetting or, like, oh, like, just painful. Yeah, not painful is my, my threshold. So, let's so set, sad. Let's, not, let's set that all aside. Let's not tell yourself okay. that anymore. Because okay. um, that is not anything that has to do with a relationship. That is nothing right. to do with a relationship. Those are mm-hmm. negative dialogues that you have. Yeah. yeah. So what you're doing is you're counting the hours or the minutes of a relationship being good, and then you're saying, okay, now it's at the bad point. Okay. Uh-huh. So you're, keep, you're keeping track, and I think, and this is my uh-huh. own psychic impression, Part of your problem is simply a habit from having had bad relationships. A lot of that could be very much so the case. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, asking you to think about it differently, do it differently, and not expect the relationship to make you happy or unhappy or not painful. Those are not relationship issues. Okay. Somebody has confused you and told you those are relationship things. No. Um. Um, When a woman uh, when a woman is pregnant, she has a different set of needs in a relationship, and having her needs ignored is psychologically damaging. I think what happened was that your uh, mother had a traumatic experience, and the release of those hormones in her brain wired you wrong for a relationship. And basically, I'm going to suggest that you get yourself. Um, rewired through doing a neurogym process and look at relationships differently. This is treatable. Okay? You need okay. to have a you need to have a positive relationship. I'm in my final seconds here. I'm gonna wrap it up and okay. I, I am sorry my time went over and I didn't get to answer your question as fully as I wanted to. I understand. Yeah, thank you though for your insight. I appreciate that.
thank you very much for being open and honest and having this dialogue with me. And what did you say that process was? Neuro something? Neuro gym. John okay, Matt. Neuro gym. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I will check that out. Very much. All right. All right. Thank Have you. Thank you. Okay, you too. Bye. Suzanne Wyman, the deep psychic, connecting you to your soul, 714-400-7384. Have a great day. Great having this conversation. I enjoyed every bit of it. And thank you so very much. All right. Bye-bye. Become a Goldilocks Productions VIP patron. Receive exclusive access to live stream special and other epic perks. Join the Goldilocks Productions VIP community today.